I have spent half of my life sitting in front of these computers, playing multiple hours of games, and surfing through the wide range of internet. The content it has, all good and bad. And then when games like Fortnite came, my whole interest in gaming dipped. Ever since then, I would just surf through the weird randomness of internet. And one afternoon, while I was going through this weird randomness of the internet, I came across the videos of Dark Web in the tour. And that made me excited to check out what more does the dark web have to offer, since the content on YouTube was limited. I decided to download Tor, and in my excitement, I never realized how dangerous this could actually be. Years of surfing through the wide content of internet, and I did the stupid mistake of not getting right safety measures before logging into the world of dark web. I logged in, and started surfing through all of the content that was in front of me and I kept scrolling through it, and there was some of the craziest and nastiest things that you can get from the internet. It was like finding what hides in the darkness, and it wasn't good. There was some stuff that was not worth mentioning. I was on this page where they were selling heads of pigs, and I wondered what the hell it was. It wasn't even a meat business outlet, just pig heads, severed heads of pigs by a chainsaw. I closed the windows and then got back again to find a better outlet, something that would be normal in the dark web. It was certain that there was at least something that would be normal in the dark web. I opened this window and there was this form out in there, and the winner would get a katana, and I was pretty certain that I wanted that, so I filled that form. And they asked me in the form, would you really like a katana? And then they asked, what hand would you hold it in? It was a weird question to ask, but I answered it nonetheless, and I filled the form and submitted it. And then I thought that that is enough for today, and I decided to stop browsing through the web and go on and play some video games. And I continued, and completely forgot about the time that I filled the form or about dark web. It had been a month, and nothing weird happened, and I had completely forgotten that I surfed through the dark web, and I wasn't really sure that I remembered anything from back then. And then out of nowhere while I was playing Call of Duty, I received a call, and the guy on the phone sounded weird and said, You've been selected to get the katana. You filled a form about a month ago, and you have been shortlisted. And I remembered that I indeed filled the form, and then I asked him, Where did you get my number from? And he replied, It was in the forum, sir. I tried remembering it, but I kept on thinking, I don't remember putting my number down in the form. And then he went on to tell me more details and cleared everything. He told me that I will receive the katana on the crossing near the home. I told him, why don't you just curry me the sword? And they said, we can't. We don't know you. You could be someone shady, and that is the reason we made at the crossing. We don't want a lunatic to get the sword. And I understood what he was trying to say, but to me it was pretty ironic that they were the ones selling the katana on the dark web, and they are worried that the receiver will be a lunatic. I agreed to his terms, and then he sent me all the details about the sword. I woke up early the next day. I was to pick up the sword and went on to do some things before that, and then arrived at the place ten minutes early and waited for the guy to drop by. About twelve minutes later, a guy came out of a van with a katana in his hand, and as he crossed the street, he grew the katana out and raised it in the air and shouted, Here is your katana, asshole! And as he was coming charging at me with the katana, just inches away before he could attack me, the guy dropped down. The katana dropped down from his hand and on the floor. There was blood coming out of his left shoulder. It was the sniper to the left corner of the roof on the building on the street. I pinned the guy down for good, tossed the katana away, and rest of the team charged at their van and they got caught. It was the katana killers. The guys covered themselves as the katana sellers, and they would kill their buyer upon asking them to receive the katana from a location that was away from any kind of surveillance, and people, and would get away for it because nobody ever saw them. I got this case a few months back, and I took it since I was away on my computers. I work for the cyber unit of the FBI, and I knew the only way to get these guys was to being them out from the dark and into the light. And so, I did. Hey guys, thanks so much for all the support. If you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, please feel free to do so. In the
weeks after the death of my brother, I found myself looking for comfort on the internet. Around four months had passed and I discovered a forum created for twins dealing with the grief of losing their other twin. Whether from ending their own life or illness, thousands across the world were brought together for this one singular purpose. I admit I was somewhat shy about posting and remained a bit of a lurker. However, as I became more comfortable with the community, I grew into a daily poster and was able to befriend many on the forum. A select few of these people and I became very close and did much to help one another to work through our grief. One member, a girl who said she was from Montana, probably did the most of all to help me move forward. She had lost her twin sister in a similar circumstance just as I had my brother and had a specific insight many others in the forum did not. It was not long until her and I were confessing our deepest secrets to each other and it was very nearly as if I hadn't lost my twin at all. You may ask why I would tell a complete stranger all my deepest and darkest secrets. I suppose the anonymity was the reason. Even if the person knows or thinks they know all about you, they still don't know your true identity and location. That aspect of the internet gives you carte blanche to bear your soul to a person you're confident doesn't know the true you. The connection we formed over my time on the forum was the best thing that could have happened to me at the time. However, my confidence in my anonymity and comfort with this person would ultimately come back to bite me and make my life on the internet and outside of it complete torture. It was an average ordinary morning when I discovered my friend's true face. I fired up my computer and opened my mail only to be overwhelmed by a barrage of angry and vicious messages. As I scrolled through each one, it soon became clear what was happening. Someone very close to me had dumped all my terrible secrets onto the forum and wider internet. I tried to deny it to myself for a long time who the identity of the person was, but I was eventually forced to face the facts. Apparently, my supposed friend on the forum had told everyone there some of my private feelings towards my dead brother and the way in which he chose to end his life. We all have those opinions or feelings we keep to ourselves because we know they wouldn't be popular with those around us. I never said anything terrible or anything like that, but most of my words surrounded my anger toward my twin. I probably could have phrased some of them better, but that's the fatal flaw of the internet. Without context or hearing the person's tone of voice, things can get lost or misconstrued. Over a short time, the situation would become far worse. The threatening messages started. People I had once called friends were now threatening my life. It wasn't just online, either. The messages were soon coming to my phone. This fact only proved to cement her guilt since she was one of the very few who had my number. The most terrifying aspect of the phone messages was that many knew my real name and address. This was when I truly came to fear for my life. I'd become a bawling and panicking mess. When I would finally sum up the courage to confront her about this, the pieces would all begin to fall into place. Her written reply laid it all out clearly. I had foolishly walked right into the clutches of a person who hated me and my family. My friend, all these months, turned out to be the drug-addicted ex-girlfriend of my brother. In my opinion, she was one of the major reasons he took his life, and my family agreed, which is why we had barred her from the funeral and anything taking place that day. She swore she'd get back at us, and boy she did. Apparently, she had been on the forum one day and guessed who I was. Just to be sure, she pretended to be a bereaved twin and started to suck up to me. Once it became obvious that I was who she thought I was, she saw it as an opportunity to get her revenge. In hindsight, things were starting to make more sense. She'd always been a bit pushy when trying to get me to tell her a secret. To make me more comfortable, she'd tell me something, which we all know now was a load of BS and I would always fall for it. All through her message, it was clear she had no remorse for what she had done. In fact, upon hearing of the many threats in my life, she decided to push things along by doxing me. What she hoped to happen had, and she was very pleased by the result. This final message was the last time I'd heard from her. No replies would come to my following emails, and soon after, I'd be forced to get a new address. After I spoke with my family and our lawyer... I took their advice and got rid of all my prior connections. This included having to move to a new place. 
I was and still am concerned about the remainder of my family. Although my brother's ex was able to get her revenge on me, the rest of them were assumed to still be in danger. My father assured me that they would be fine and from all appearances he may be correct, at least for now. I had stepped away from the internet for almost nine months and am just now beginning to dip my foot back into the pool. Naturally, I will never return to the forum in which all these problems spawned. Even though I've not yet had any run-ins with anyone from there, I will never again expose myself to the level of being identified. Even the account from which this story has been sent is a one-time use throwaway. So if any of those coming across this story may have any questions, I'm sorry. None will be forthcoming anytime soon, and certainly not from this account. If there's anything you can take away from this mishap, perhaps it is a lesson of caution. I and many others have discovered to our detriment how big of a sewer the internet can be. Like the sewer, there lurk many rats. On the internet, the rats are waiting and hiding to destroy others. Many have no reasons. They're just evil. I suppose I'm trying to advise you all to be careful and remember that no one on the internet is really your friend unless you know them in real life. And although many perils linger there, the internet is not real life. Ron Erickson was weird, vulgar, and broken, like many men can be in the military. We knew he had a sordid past, and we knew his upbringing was strange to say the least. He seemed like a harmless man. My husband, Ben, went to the same post-boot camp school as this guy. He and a handful of the boys were bonded by these terrible conditions and even terrible higher-ups while attending the school. Ben married me while on leave. We'd been together a long time and known each other much longer than that. Eventually, we moved into an apartment together at his duty station in Southern California. It was wonderful. Ron would come around occasionally and spend weekends with Ben. Sometimes he even slept in our home on the sofa or on an air mattress in the living room. Eventually we moved to a larger house in the military base and Ron had to deploy to Japan. It was a long six months. Life went on normally without him. Friends came and went. This isn't unique. Eventually it was Ben's turn to deploy. It was hard to cope, but fine. We said our goodbyes and smooched and he was off to strengthen his sea legs for the next six months. When Ron came back to California, one week after Ben deployed, he wanted to pick up a box of his things from our home that we had tucked away for safekeeping for him. I was excited to see the familiar face. He picked up his things, shared small talk, and left. Nothing strange at all, honestly. Knowing he was back from his journey and many of his friends were deployed with Ben, I extended some kind and friendly words over Facebook Messenger occasionally, wishing him well and being polite. Unfortunately for both of us, he mistook my kindness as romantic gestures. One night at 2 a.m., Ron called me via Facebook's calling feature. Concerned for him, I answered. I thought the worst. Had he become depressed? Maybe even thinking about taking his own life? I can't in good consciousness deny a listening ear to someone who maybe needed it, especially someone my husband is somewhat fond of. The conversation started somewhat normal as normal as a strange unwarranted 2 a.m. call could be. He was loud, possibly drunk, and sounded desperate for conversation. He rambled on Fora while they admitted to me that, as a child, he had had a relationship with his young stepsister. He talked in a lot of circles, but a few statements that stood out to me were, I just can't trust myself around women, especially alone. I've always liked you. I think you're hot and I remember the way you looked in your bikini at the beach. During this conversation, I should have hung up on him. I made several attempts to keep the content friendly and uplifting, assuming that he was having some sort of episode. It was all horrible and made me feel disgusting. He then told me he was near my house at another girl's house. I assume was some poor guy's awful cheating wife. He said she wasn't really anything to him and he wanted to come over to my house. He knew Ben was an ocean away and that I was alone in my house. I told him not to come and he hung up on me. I panicked and closed all of the first floor windows and doors, making sure that they were all locked. I turned off the lights as well. I took my dog and cat up to my bedroom and locked the door, 
wedging pieces of furniture into the door to create a barricade of sorts. He showed up. He walked around my house, pulled on the doors, calling my phone, messaging me horrible things. I screamed for him to leave both on the phone and through my upstairs window. It was a nightmare, realized. I could get in if I really wanted to, he messaged me, a clear threat in my opinion. I called the police and then I called my neighbor, a big navy doc who I feel that I owe my life to. After being chased off by Hunter, my neighbor, and having long talks with PMO, NCIS, and my neighbors, I received a protection order against Ron. I'm disappointed there wasn't any brig time for this idiot, but I'm pleased I have documented evidence in case he ever tries to contact me or my husband again. You really never know someone. Stay safe, friends, and exercise your right to bear arms, if you so choose. <laughs>